Well, good afternoon, everyone. Hope everybody had a good, good weekend. Today I want to talk about where we've been, where we are today, and where we're going in the future in regard to our battle uh, with COVID-19. But before I do that, um, I would like to remind all of us, myself included, uh, of, of three things. And I would ask for you to keep these in mind um, as we talk about this today and as we talk about this in the future, uh, because I think these three things are, are very, very important. One, you have done an amazing job. Um, staying at home, staying, staying apart, uh, the things that we ask you to do, uh, Ohioans have stepped up. And candidly, we are where we are today, where we can start going back, coming back, start getting the economy moving, start getting people back to work. Uh, we are here because of what you have done. Um, it's mattered. You've got the job done. Number two, second fact, the coronavirus is still here. Uh, it's just as dangerous as it's ever been. It is still living amongst us. I was thinking about this this weekend, and I thought back to when Fran and I were children growing up. Saturday morning, we'd go to catechism, St. Paul Catholic Church in Yellow Springs, and the nuns, nuns taught us. And uh, I remember, it's kind of seared in my memory, the nuns talking about the devil, and the devil is roaming the world, searching for souls. I'm not saying that the virus is the devil. Uh, I've described it as a, a monster. Um, but it is searching, and it's searching for bodies. And the way it does it, of course, is going from one body to the other. Um, and many of the things that you have done, you have dramatically slowed this process. Um, but it's still there. You know, the virus is still out. Uh, it's still in Ohio, just as dangerous as it was before. Third fact. The tools that we have had to slow it down, to break it from going from one person to another are still the same as they've always been. We actually have a couple of new ones, but the essential ones, the most important ones, are still the same. What are they? Distance, distance, distance. Keeping that distance. Second, uh, washing your hands. Third, the normal sanitation of surfaces and other things. And what I normally call a mask, uh, it's, I don't know if it's a, a true mask or not, but it, it's something to cover our face, a face covering. Um, and these are the things that we have used successfully, and these are the things that we're gonna have to continue to do as we start moving forward uh, in the economy. I had a conversation, and first of all, I want to thank our business group. Uh, we had men and women from bigger companies, mid-sized companies, small companies, uh, and asked them to come together and, 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 and help us in coming up with the right protocols. And, and frankly, we've learned from things that have occurred with businesses that were allowed to stay open and some of the things that they have done. Uh, where they've done a really, really good job. But the person who headed that up uh, was Frank Sullivan. Uh, and I had a conversation with Frank this morning, had a lot of conversations with him um, as this has been being put together, uh, something that Lieutenant Governor uh, worked on daily. But Frank said to me, you know, Mike, he says, the idea that we can't do two things at once in Ohio is crazy. We're Ohioans. We can do two things at once. We can get this economy moving back, at the same time, continue to protect each other uh, and protect our communities. So 
And let's talk a little bit about that. And let's talk, let me start with kind of where we are and what we've accomplished. Um, and I want to talk, as you'll see some of these things I'm going to show you, um, they directly relate, directly relate to getting us moving in May and getting us moving forward. So I'm going to start, Eric, if I could, with the COVID-19 statistics that we just got uh, a few minutes ago. And I'll start uh, cases. As you can see the total number of cases. But what I always look at is over here to this side. Five-day reported case average. So you go back in five days and look at what we've seen. What's that average? So let's start with cases. Five-day reported average. You go back five days, 442. That was the average for each day. Last 24 hours, 362. So you can see we're going in the right direction, down. Deaths. Deaths are a, a lagging indicator. Uh, and so these are always far behind whatever else is, is, is occurring. Um, in the last 24 hours, what was reported is the deaths of 25 of our fellow citizens were reported. The five-day average, going back five days, was 29. Hospitalizations, again, something that I always, always want to look at. And, and these are things I look at every morning. Last reported, last 24 hour reported hospitalizations, new ones, 54. Five day average was 70. Again, that one's going, that one is going in the right direction. ICU admissions, last 24 hours, 26. Five day average is 20. So you can see with these lines that what you have done has made a difference. Now we're not there. We haven't had two weeks coming down, uh, but we're moving. We're moving in the right direction. And it's because of what you have done, and that is just so very, very important. Let me share with you uh, something else. And remember, I talked, I've talked about May as a crucial month. We needed to fight this virus two additional things besides what you have been doing. We need two additional things. We need to ramp up testing dramatically, and we need at the same time to do the tracing. So I want to start with, with the testing. Remember last week we talked about, early in the week, I talked about asking Governor Celeste, former Governor Celeste, former Governor Taft, to come in and help us. Uh, they did that. They pulled together with, with, with our team. Uh, we were able to get an agreement with Thermal Fisher uh, in regard to a problem that we've had and other states have had, and that is the inability to get enough reagent. Um, that was a major breakthrough. Also, last week, the Manufacturer Alliance, uh, specifically Road Dental, now we have come up with a method to consistently make a lot more swabs every single day. So those two things coming together, this is what May looks like. This is what our projection is. We'll start April 29th, that's this Wednesday. And you'll see at the top in white, daily testing totals. Uh, and you'll see e each week from then where we go. Uh, so April 29th, that week, we will be able that for that next seven days, daily testing at about 7,200 a day. That's significantly above what we've had. Uh, a weekly total, roughly 43,000. The week beginning May 6th, we double it, 14,000. And again, you'll see the number doubling down below. That's the weekly total. We go to May 13th, we're up to 18, 18,000 per day. These are per day now. May 20th, we're up to 20,000 a day. May 27th. 22,000. Now, these are what we think we're going to be able to achieve. But we think we have a real shot at getting those numbers and being able to come up with that much capacity to, to, to test. So, 
again, in May, a lot of interesting things are happening, and things that we've been waiting for, things that we've been trying to get going. Last week, it kicked in. Let's go to tracing. We talked last week about tracing. Tracing and testing go together. And the tracing, as the doctor explained it last week, is something that health departments have done for years. Nothing new about tracing. Simply trying to break that, separate people, so when someone has it, someone's been exposed to it, then they don't expose someone else. It's kind of basic. Um, and it's, again, something that our 113 health departments know how to do. But the challenge is they've never had this many to do. This is at, at a scale that we've never seen before. And so if we're going to move the economy forward, open things up, We've got to be able to do the testing, we've got to do the tracing, and you all have got to continue to do the separation and all the things that you have been doing. So, this is the contact tracing workforce. It takes people. Start over at the left. We have about 685 local public health workers at local health departments around the state of Ohio who are trained to do this. They're there. But that's not, clearly is not gonna be enough. So we have right now under tier one, we see tier one, we have about 900 volunteers. Uh, these are people who have been doing other things. They've said that they could volunteer to do this. And we are using, some of the local health departments are using some of these volunteers now. But we know that this could be with us for a year, 18 months, and that this tracing is gonna have to be done over a long period of time. And so hiring people for the long haul is probably where we need to go. So we're getting money uh, to go to, to each of the health departments around the state so they can hire people to do this. Uh, we're gonna bring in the training to train them. Uh, again, this, this goes, goes back uh, to Partners in Health, the group that I told, told you about. Uh, they will come in and help us train uh, these, these workers. This is a pool that we're putting together at the state level. And Tier 2 and Tier 3 are really occurring simultaneously as we move forward through the month. What is that group for? It's for if, if we have a nursing home where we have a number of people who have the virus or, or if we have something else in a community, a village, somewhere else where the local health department is just overrun, we will be able to surge people in there to make a difference. Our goal, goal, aspirational goal, June 1, 1,750 workers in process. So again, a lot of things we believe will happen in May. And the tracing, the testing enables us to move forward uh, it, to start back to open up, open up the economy uh, even, even more. I don't think I have to tell any Ohioan um, the importance of moving forward. Uh, My heart aches for the businessmen and women who have not been able to work, who are looking at savings going down every day. The people who work in those businesses, people who are unemployed. Um, one cannot overstate uh, the tragedy of this. So we've got to get moving. We've got to get people back back to work, we've got to open things up, and at the same time, we've got to protect Ohioans. So let's talk about how we are going to move forward. And let me just say, uh, add one more thing, and uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, the other day did a very, very good job talking about this. There are many health uh, results when the economy goes down, and they're not good. Uh, depression goes up, domestic violence goes up. Um, and I could go on and on. So these are things that are directly related to people's well-being, directly related to their health. Um, the anxiety of not having a paycheck, anxiety of not knowing how you're gonna take care of your family. So these are all things that impact people's lives. I've talked a lot, we've talked a lot about uh, 
and I know a lot of speculation in the news media and among people, when we're we gonna op open this up, when we're we gonna open that up, what's it gonna be? And that's, those are all logical questions. But I think the most important question really is how we do it. Because if we do it right, we can provide as much protection as we can, there's always risk, much protection as we can to our workers, much protection as we can to everyone in, involved. And so the how is very important. Let me start with our first announcement on May 1. We're going to have a health care opening. I want to talk a little bit about why we had slowed things down at hospitals. On March 17th, Director Acton issued an order in regard to non-essential medical procedures. Why was that order issued? It was issued because we needed to make sure that as the virus continued to spread, that we had enough hospital beds to take care of it, that we had enough personal protection equipment uh, for our first responders, our hospital workers, people in nursing homes, et cetera. And we also wanted to utilize, make sure that we are having the social distancing. Well, again, you all have done a great job. Uh, the hospitals are not full. We have space. Um, done a good job of the social distancing. The one area that is still not quite where we want it is personal protection. Uh, it's coming. Uh, we've st stood up more sources in Ohio and other places. We've secured more of this. But it's not exactly where we want it. And that is the thing that we remain concerned about. But we have a team work that works on this absolutely every single day uh, to try to secure more of the personal protection equipment. Our order that we're issuing for May 1, uh, all health procedures that can be done that do not require an overnight stay in a hospital, we will be able to move forward with those procedures, operations or procedures. And I would ask you to remember that under the old order, um, when surgeries were necessary, even if the person stayed overnight, um, those were still allowed. For example, and this is from the order that was issued before, a threat to the patient's life if surgery or procedure is delayed. Those have always been allowed. Two, a threat of permanent dysfunction of an extremity or organ system um, or possibly the spread of cancer. Those have certainly been allowed all through this. Um, three, um, pain. Someone has um, significant pain and there's a procedure that can be done to, to alleviate that pain. Those have always been allowed. Four, uh, the presence of severe symptoms causing an inability to perform the normal actions of daily life. So those have all been there. So we build upon those and then include um, any, pr any procedure uh, that can be done uh, where the person does not spend the night in the hospital. Um, we also, dentists, dentists, veterinarians should also, beginning May 1, be able to be at, at full steam ahead. So all of this occurs um, on May 1. Uh, the only thing that is left uh, is some elective surgeries. Uh, and as we see how we're moving forward and the availability of PPE, we will, when that time is appropriate, open that up as, as well. But this is a major, major change. And I know Dr. Acton will, will talk in a little bit about something that has occurred, not as a result of our order, but something that has occurred um, because people have been afraid. People have been afraid to go to their doctor. People have been afraid to go to the hospital. And so irrespective of these orders uh, that have never blocked that, um, we have seen, for example, well baby 
visits have gone down. Many things have gone down. And, and Dr. Atkins is going to talk a little bit about that and the importance of kind of getting back in the game uh, in regard to making sure your children, uh, making sure yourself are having, having the appointments uh, that, that you need. I want to move now to May 4th. Uh, May 4th, manufacturing, distribution, and construction. Uh, that will be opened up. Um, as I said, we've learned a lot from businesses that stayed open. And some of the things that uh, we have provided in this order, uh, we've learned, frankly, from business. Uh, but again, it goes back what we're going to require of, of the companies that open up and also any company that's already open. Uh, when these orders go in on May 4th, uh, this will apply to any manufacturing, any distribution, any construction, whether it was open before or, or not. Um, again, the, what I think people should look at is how, how we are doing it. And we're doing it in as safe a way as humanly possible based upon what we have learned and what health experts have advised us. So let's look at that, that chart. In fact, let me, before I do that, let me, let me call your attention to this one. Because this one, COVID-19, responsible protocols for getting Ohio back to work. So these will, by and large, apply to any company that will be opened up under today's orders or, or, or future orders. Um, and we've kind of done it. The goal, protect the health of employees and customers, their families, support community efforts to control the spread of the virus, lead in responsibly getting Ohio back to work, protocols for all business, one, and we've summarized it in kind of a little quote here, no mask, no work, no service, no exception. So every employee will have to have a facial covering. And again, these don't have to be fancy, uh, but a facial covering is, is very important. Require face coverings for employees and clients and customers at all times. Two, conduct daily health assessments by employers and employees. Self-evaluation to determine if that person is fit for duty. Three, good hygiene at all times, hand washing, social distancing. Four, clean and sanitize workplaces throughout workday and at the close of business. And over here, limit capacity to meet social distancing guidelines. At a minimum, no more than 50% of the fire code. And it says here, use appointments setting appointment setting where possible to limit congestion. Again, that depends on, on the nature, obviously, of, uh, of the business. Take the following actions when a COVID-19 infection is identified. Immediately report employer or customer to the local health department. Work with local health department to identify potentially exposed individuals to help facilitate appropriate communication, contact tracing, and shut down the shop floor for deep sanitation if, if, if possible. Um, so these are kind of the basic principles. I uh, wanted to put it on one page so people could just look at it, see it, pretty easy, easy to, to understand. Um, so these will all be up on our web page, I believe, by, by 5 o'clock, uh, 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock, I guess, they'll be up. Um, so they'll be up on our web page, and people can look at them. Now let's go directly to uh, the manufacturing. And again, these are very, very consistent um, with what was on the, the more general uh, slide that we just had over here. Um, let me just say a couple of things. Again, it, it's basic principles. Distancing. Uh, people have to be kept apart. Uh, if they can't physically be kept apart, there's got to be a screen, there's got to be something that, that can protect them. Uh, we've seen businesses manufacturing companies that have been able to do all every single one of these requirements, uh, many companies that are out there today are, a, are actually doing. And again, you'll be able to look at these um, and, and, and up on the web page and any, any manufacturing company who's looking at that May 4th date, distribution company, construction company will, will have all of that uh, available. Let me... Uh, 
also say on May 4th, uh, general office offices will be able to be open. Um, this is the chart for that, or it will be in a moment. That's the, uh, and, and I'll just call attention to, to several things on here, but the, to me the most important is um, companies have found out that many of the members of their office can work from home and be just as efficient. Uh, we are asking companies as they go back into their office space to continue to do that as much as humanly possible, uh, continue to have people work from home. Again, uh, we are all in this together, and, and, and what they do is going to allow us to move forward quicker as far as the opening, opening of, of Ohio. So personnel work from home, if at all humanly possible. Uh, let me go now um, to May 12th. May 12th, uh, consumer, retail, and services. Um, again, this is, will be up on the web page. It's pretty simple. It's one, it is one page. But maybe call your attention to several things that, that, that are, in fact, uh, up there. Uh, one, all employees will, will, mer will wear facial uh, covering. Uh, the same thing will be true uh, in regard to customers. So... We encourage customer. We encourage every Ohioan when you're out in public to wear a facial covering. Uh, we are not going to mandate that, but when someone goes, as a customer goes into a business, they will have to have that facial covering because they will be dealing in a retail setting, and they will be dealing with the people who who are working there. And the thing that we have learned uh, that Dr. Acton has talked uh, a lot about, uh, and several of the doctors who we've had Skyped in here have talked about, uh, is that really when you put that on, facial covering, you're protecting the other person. And so when two people do that, um, each one is protecting the other one. It is not a substitute for social distancing, but it is as Dr. Acton has said, like the Swiss cheese where you just keep layering things on. The more things you do, uh, the more protection that, that we provide. So this may be a little different. Uh, you know, wa walking in uh, to a, a store, uh, but all these requirements, of course, will be uh, in place for companies that are already open. For example, the grocery stores that, that have been allowed to be open, uh, when we get to May 12th, Every, every retail outlet that is open will have to be able to follow, follow these, these particular protocols. Let me um, add a couple more things before I uh, turn this over to Lieutenant Governor. Um, the stay-at-home orders will still be in place. Now, obviously, they're modified um, in that companies that are now open, people who are working the companies obviously will be able to go there and work. The same tr is true with retail. When the retail is opening up, um, anybody who wants to go to the retail obviously is going to be able to, to do that. Um, the gatherings, 10 people gathering uh, ruling uh, or order is going to remain on. So I think you can kind of see what we're trying to do. We're trying to ease out uh, we're trying to get Ohio's, Ohio back working. We know there's more things to do. Uh, we need to see how this works. Uh, we need to monitor the numbers. Uh, we need to see how our tracing and our testing is going. Mm -hmm. We believe we can live up to those, those goals that we, we, we put up there. So a lot of moving parts, a lot of things going on. Uh, this is the beginning. But to be able to do it and to continue to, to move forward without occurring something that no one wants to see occur. And I've had businessmen and women tell me this and average citizens tell me this. We don't want to go back. You know, we don't want to open things up and then have to fall back. We don't want to see a huge spike um, in hospitalizations. We don't want to see a huge spike uh, in cases. Um, the virus is still out there. It's not going to go away. But 
there are a lot of things we can do to lessen its impact, and, and we've been doing those, and we just have to continue to do those. At the same time, uh, we're trying to get folks back to work and, uh, and make, make that happen. I, I want to call special attention um, to the people who are the most vulnerable. And again, Dr. Acton may talk a little bit about that. But as we look at who is the most vulnerable, um, we have to start off with, if you look at deaths, uh, the deaths have not been nearly as high. They've been much, much higher, obviously, the older someone gets. And they go, and they go up when someone has a medical problem. Um, anybody can get this, it would appear, and anyone can be ill. And if you look at national numbers, you'll see that even you know, younger people uh, can, can die as a result of it. Uh, but we do know that those 65 years of age or older are in a um, much, much more difficult situation. Um, we know um, that anybody with chronic lung disease, uh, moderate to severe asthma, uh, severe obesity, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, undergoing dialysis, uh, liver disease, uh, and, and on. Uh, that so those individuals, again, um, we just would remind you to be exceedingly careful. Uh, you know, you are at much greater risk if you get it uh, as far as uh, what, what can happen. Um, so again, um, let me thank Ohioans. We've gotten this far. Uh, we've got a ways to go. This is a, these are first steps, uh, first steps in regard to retail, first steps in regard to moving forward with manufacturing, with, with office, with the medical side. Uh, these are things that we've been waiting to do. Uh, because of what you d have done, we are now in the position to do them. Uh, I know there are other things that all of us want to do. Uh, people want to get a haircut, want to get their hair cut. Uh, people want to go back uh, to restaurants. And all those things we're anxious to do as well. But we've got to see how we're doing with these numbers. We've got to watch it for a few weeks. Um, but we've already started conversations. I uh, had conversations Saturday morning uh, with some folks who, who run restaurants, own restaurants. Uh, we've had convert started conversations uh, with people who cut hair. And uh, those conversations are going to continue. And, and we're going to get those online as fast as we can. And I'm also aware, uh, certainly, uh, as a grandfather and, and, and father, there's a lot of things that we all want to do this summer. Uh, there's a lot of things, summer camp and other things that kids want to do um, and that adults want to do. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Uh, we've just got to see how this is going to work. We've got to see how the numbers look. Uh, we don't want to go backward. Uh, so one, one step at a time, but I think we were set for May to be a very good month as we move forward uh, with, with the testing that we have, uh, with the tracing, and with all of you doing what you've been doing. Lieutenant Governor. Thank you very much, Governor. Yes, I know all of those things are already on our list as soon as we leave here today to keep thinking about and figuring out what the, the best way is to think about them. Uh, I, I know that there will be a lot of questions about the specifics, and, and we're going to answer all of those questions. I, I did, just did want to take a moment, though, um, to, to just talk a little bit about the process and the thought process of all the people we talked to, because we've certainly learned a lot since March. Um, we've uh, learned lessons on how we can solve problems and everything from changing our habits to supply chains to new, new strategies, everything that goes in to start from zero with a virus that nobody knew to figure out to get us to where we are today. It, it's, it's been an amazing, um, amazing reaction from the public and the people of America and the people of Ohio uh, to come this far in such a short period of time. Uh, the plan we announced today is really the best advice that we got from a variety of voices. People in the medical community, which are, are certainly a, a little more cautious because of what they know. Uh, people in the economic and the business community who are, are a little more aggressive because of the consequences that they know. Uh, and there were a variety of opinions. And, and bringing that together 
was an, inc an incredible challenge and balancing act. But the one thing I want you to know is that everybody's voice was heard, and the governor heard them. Uh, the governor heard them lots uh, and lots of times. And we're trying to balance all of those voices. Um, many of those voices rightly expressed that the concern about the coronavirus is not going away, that it's going to be here through 2020, and it will continue to be a threat in our lives. Uh, we heard that a lot. And that if you do make a decision solely on that basis, well, then you would reopen nothing uh, because the threat is still out there. But every decision has risks. It has health risks. It has societal risks. It has personal risks. It has uh, economic risks. Doing nothing is a risk. It's that balance of figuring out all of those things and how they fit together. You can't look at it through just one lens. You've got to hear all of the voices uh, that exist that are important in the decision. Assault about this uh, coronavirus because we, we talk to lots of people. He regularly reminds me that there's not a lot of information about the virus and that there is no, de no easy decision or no certainty with anything we do. Uh, but we also have learned how to reduce risk, and that's what the governor outlined. That is a risk management uh, proposal that helps us reduce the risk of coronavirus in our lives. And those provisions in this plan are aimed at, at doing just that. Uh, the plan for opening your business or rejoining the workforce uh, is one that is going to keep employees safe uh, and their customers safer as well. Uh, the one thing that I like about where we are at this point in time is that we're not just sitting back. We're taking steps and we're fighting back. Uh, the testing and tracing is a great tool that the governor talked about to do that. We're going to hunt it down, this coronavirus, we're going to isolate it, and we're going to kill it with that. Uh, we're going to be aggressive at, at getting Ohio through this with the best health and economic strategy that we can muster. And you combine the testing with the distancing, the disinfecting, and the wearing of the masks, and it is an effective coronavirus strategy. And, you know, just I just want to reflect on this and take us back just a little bit. The primary, or a primary reason, not the primary reason, for the aggressive restrictions was to make sure that we didn't overwhelm uh, our health care system. Uh, and thanks to the governor's early decisiveness and the actions of the people of Ohio, uh, that didn't happen. And, but just because that didn't happen doesn't mean we can let up. It, we just can't let up. We have to continue to be smart. Uh, to make sure that that trend continues to go in the right direction and that we will be able to sustain this continued rollback of restrictions into the future. Uh, and we need to take the same vigilance of all of us, take it on all of us, to do what we've always been doing on social distancing, dis disinfecting and wearing masks, and um, to keep this coronavirus under control. I've said this many times, the coronavirus is with us. Uh, this is the next phase in learning how to live with it safely so we can protect people's lives and livelihoods. Uh, and the strategy today is the best thought that we could put together from all of those many voices who've been giving us advice. So, Governor, thank you. Dr. Acton. Uh, thank you, Governor. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's very good to be with you again. Um, I had the good fortune of being able, for the first time, to really watch these press conferences my, myself at home. Um, and I, you know, there, there's so much you can't see sometimes when you're in the middle of something and in the middle of the intensity of what we have gone through. Um, I took some advice from a, a mentor, one of the many mentors along this way. Um, his name is Ron Heifetz. He is a co-founder of the Center for Leadership at Harvard. And he often teaches in his classes and in a conversation um, I had and by proxy with him recently that you have to, you're, you have a hard job as a leader. You have to be on the dance floor, being in the dance, but every now and then you have to get up to the balcony and kind of look out at the dance floor. And I have to say these couple of days I've had have really helped recenter me in this work going forward. 
And, you know, as everyone has said here, you know, the real issue we face, the real challenge is this virus. And global pandemics themselves can be very challenging um, for so many more reasons, not just the virus itself, but the disruption it brings to our lives, to our supply chains, to everything we've sort of known. And it's, it's all of that that can be equally difficult. So we know we sort of climbed a mountain and we plateaued and we're coming down that mountain now. And for those of us who have, have climbed mountains, we know sometimes that it's actually a little more difficult on that road coming down the mountain. And as the Lieutenant Governor said, um, there is so much, while we are knowing and learning so much every day, one of the greatest strengths of our team is that they're listeners and they're learners. And at every step of the way, we ask hard questions. And, and that will go on. That will never stop in this process. But there are so many things we don't know and are still learning. And there's some things we have learned on this journey. One of the things we know is we have to respect the mountain. We have to respect this virus. Um, it will continue to evolve and we'll continue to navigate it. Um, but I read some remarks by um, Dr. Fairchild. She's the dean of the College of Public Health that got me thinking about this uncharted territory that we are going to wisely navigate together. But we're entering the next phase. We're entering um, in this historical experience we're having. This next phase will also be accompanied by stresses and anxieties and excitement about new innovations. Um, new things will take shape as we move forward. We will have successes. We will have occasional setbacks. We will learn from those, and we will have more successes. But it is that journey, um, going down that mountain, and then going over these hills that we know are coming um, that we'll do together. It really has to be a collective effort. And it reminded me again of public health. When I became a physician, public health to me was being a pediatrician and helping an individual patient. The field of public health is about knowing all of us, and all of us are that individual patient, each and every one of us our well-being. But what public health taught me was about the collective, how it takes all segments of society to ensure health, from nonprofits to businesses to government, to what we do as individuals. And I mentioned once before the socio-ecologic model, which means that in public health, I think about you as individual well-being and all your behaviors, your genetic, those vulnerabilities that some of us have that the governor mentioned, whether we have predispositions or we're, we're more older and more at risk, or we have other diseases as we're learning with this virus. But then I have to think about you in the context of your relationships and your family and your, the, the, your school and places you meet up together. Then I think of it in terms of the next layer circle out, which is, the institutions we all are, where we work, live, play, and making sure, as Dr. Ware showed you, that you're in healthy environments. Occupational health is part of health for that very reason. And all of that is then another layer out are all the ways we build through our institutions and our policies that surround that. So your health and well-being is never a zero-sum game. It's never your individual health pit against where you work. It's never just your health versus your, where, you, where you do your faith. It's all you. It's all you in the life you lead. And so for me, public health really is about all of those things collectively. And to move forward, we are all going to have to continue to be our best selves, whether it's ourself as a parent and what we're doing with our kids, ourself as that school teacher, ourself as that business owner. The way Ohio is going to be strong is all of us continuing to be our best selves together. I believe we are going to do, just as we, we attacked this first phase, I believe all of us in Ohio are going to do this next phase together with all that same spirit. It's essential that we do this all together. And we will balance all of this together. 
And most importantly, our communities will lead in this. And again, we will continue to help, listen to you, and help you along this journey. Thank you. Okay, questions. I just saw the press corps move in mass there. <laughs> or mask, <laughs> sorry. Uh, none, none of the above. Uh, look, we, we talked about, I talked about restaurants as we move forward, hair salons as we move forward. Uh, we know there's a great desire to, to move forward on that. We know we want to get people back into restaurants. We know we want to get the workers uh, who can work and the, and the folks who own, own to get, get going. Uh, we also know that daycare remains a big challenge for people. Uh, what we wanted to start doing was starting down the pathway of opening things up where we thought there was less risk, frankly, uh, and at least more controllable risk, uh, more ability to control the environment. Um, you know, daycare is very difficult, as schools are, to obviously control the environment. Doesn't mean it's not necessary, does not, doesn't mean it's not very, very important, and I understand what families are going through, but uh, we want to start down the pathway that is the things that are the easiest control. Jack Windsor, WMFD TV, Mansfield. Uh, question for either Dr. Acton or Governor DeWine. Uh, last week, Dr. Acton said 5% to 15% of us are infected. Uh, random sampling from around the country uh, confirms that infection rate. At 5%, the fatality rate is 0 .001 and in line with the flu. At 15%, it's 0 .0004, about half the flu. The 0 .001 is playing out globally. Um, Governor DeWine, you said February 24th, the odds are we will lose more people to the flu. Combined, you two had great instinct about the contagion and the mortality. Now, given the goal to increase consumer confidence to engage in commerce and to increase constituent confidence to live life as we come out of lockout, my question is, do you have a plan to strike the previous narrative that this is both highly contagious and 20 times more deadly? And is there a plan to get people confident that's, uh, that it is highly contagious but has a low mortality rate so that people get out of fear? And what does that plan look like? Okay, I'm gonna let Dr. Acton deal, deal with the medical side of it. Look, it is, it is contagious. Um, as we find out more about it and we find out that it um, is more prevalent than we thought, uh, more people who would test positive but don't show the signs, um, that to me indicates that it also is more dangerous because people, it would appear at least, uh, that people can be infecting other people and they don't know it. Uh, the person who's the host does not know that at all and has no reason to take precautions. Obviously, the other person does not know that at all. What we put together uh, is a plan based upon um, the, all the information that we have um, about how dangerous this is, uh, but we also know it's dangerous not to have people working. And we know there's social consequences, there's medical consequences, there's health consequences. And so we're trying to balance the two. Uh, we think we've come up with, a, with a, a plan in May that starts us back pretty hard at it. And, um, you know, the plan would be as long as we're not seeing, you know, numbers that are horribly alarming, very al alarming, um, you know, we're going to, we will continue down that pathway. But we are still losing, as you saw. Uh, we're losing a lot of Ohioans every week, and that's probably going to, you know, going to continue. What we don't want to see is just a, you know, massive spike in that. Dr. Acton. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question, and I think one thing that is important for us to remember is, at each step of the way, we're going to learn more and more about this virus. So, what was known, say, on March 10th, you know, and what we knew. And each time we say something or make a decision is in the context of that date. So let me tell you what we know now about mortality. Still not a lot. I mean, we have estimates coming out of China 
in other countries, but one of the problems you face with this virus is that we don't have widespread testing. We don't yet know the prevalence in Ohio or in most places. We've got some preliminary prevalence information out of places like New York that have been able to do some testing. We hope to do that here soon. And the numerator and the denominator of this will continue to change as we can test more people. Deaths and spread. So our country is still very early in this pandemic relatively to other countries. So we look to what other countries see. Um, and those actual fatality rates will, will take months, if not years, to fully understand that data because we will learn more and more about deaths that were attributed, deaths that have happened that weren't yet attributed, like we saw in California, where in autopsy they found the virus in, in early, early parts of this year, but that person was never diagnosed as dying from COVID. So for now, we don't know that. We know it's very infectious. We continue to know it's very deadly. Um, I'd have to say some of those percentages were not correct in, in that last statement, but I think we'll know fully uh, the, the mortality. We should also talk, we'll be learning more about the morbidity and the long-term effects on people getting sick, the people who don't die, but the long-term effects on our health. So all that is something we're yet to learn. Hi, everyone. This is Molly Martinez with Spectrum News. Governor, you mentioned that dentists would be on that May 1st rollout, and they're sort of the, the first wave of people going back to work. But within the dental community, I've heard a lot that uh, back in March when we were all hands on deck and everybody who had PPE had to donate it, dentists were a part of that group, and they haven't been able to replenish their PPE, and they feel very vulnerable going back to work, not having those protections, and also working in a heightened, dangerous environment with aerosols and with people just open mouth. So uh, what would you say to, to them? We, we will certainly try to help them uh, with the PPE. Um, the, the choice about going back um, with the P, you know, assuming they have PPE, that choice to go back is certainly theirs. And it's, you know, it's not a requirement that anybody go back. I, I understand that if someone would not want to do that. But um, again, um, with the, with the PPE, um, you know, they can make the, the decision to move to move forward. Uh, what we're faced with, um, you know, is when you have, particularly in regard to the hospitals as well, uh, people were deferring health care. Uh, and sometimes they were deferring health care, not because of the order, uh, but because they were afraid. And I understand the fear. Uh, but the hospitals are, are working very hard. Uh, doctors are working very hard to protect that person when they come in. And so I think, uh, while I understand the fear, uh, there's also a problem of people deferring their health care uh, very long, and particularly with things like mammograms and other things that should be, should be done whenever they're supposed to be done. And you can defer them, I guess, a little bit, but you wouldn't want to defer these things very long. So it's something that, you know, when we looked at this and see what we could do um, in this area was something that we felt that we could we can open back up. Obviously, it becomes an individual choice uh, between the, that's between the doctor and, and the patient. Governor DeWine, hello. It's Todd Dykes from WLWT TV in Cincinnati. Good to see you all today. You talk about having testing capacity by the end of May at 20, 27,000 tests a day with a state that has a population of 11 million. How do, you, uh, how do you explain to Ohioans that that would be enough test? Is that enough testing capacity at that point going forward, or do you still need to, do you still want to achieve a much higher number than that? Well, that's, that's really not the entire testing because it does not include private labs. And as long as private labs can test and get results back quickly, um, you know, they can, they can rock and roll and do whatever. Uh, you're also seeing some pharmacies that are that are contracting with other folks to do to do testing. So I would expect testing to be more robust than what we saw there. What we were trying to come up with is what the number is that we would we were going to be able to do with the eight hospitals uh, around the state where we are trying to drive the, the the two things: one contact 
the testing that goes along with the contacts, vice versa, uh, as well as going in and being concerned and testing in nursing homes, for example, and other congregate care facilities and going in and sampling those and doing that so that we could get some feel for what is what is going on. And so so th the numbers that we see or what that we put up on the board or what we think um, and we think that that will coincide with what we are able to do in regard to tracing and with both of them up, um, you know, we'll have the ability to to limit uh, exposure, which is what we're trying to do, limit the people who get who, who get who pick up this virus. Hi, Governor Kevin Landers, WBNS 10 TV. Uh, when you woke up this morning, how confident were you that this plan that you outlined today would not backfire? And for Dr. Acton, do you think that the stay at home order in any way conflicts with your own medical advice you gave earlier about 14 days of seeing cases decrease? Thank you. Well, I'll go first, and then Dr. Acton can go. Um, as Lieutenant Governor indicated, uh, we're pretty good listeners. I um, think all the members of the General Assembly have my, my cell phone and my email, and so I've heard from a lot of them, uh, but I've also heard from just average citizens. Um, and so, you know, we've consulted a lot of doctors, we've consulted a lot of different experts, but ultimately, the decision is my decision, uh, and I, I take full responsibility for the decision. Uh, with any decision, there is risk. Uh, w whatever we did today was a risk. Doing nothing is a risk. Uh, doing nothing and let the status quo continue is a risk. Uh, and if we'd done that, the big risk, of course, is um, you know, our economy continues to go down, and all the bad things that go with that uh, all, all the social indicators and medical indicators that, that go the wrong way, um, that has to be factored in. So when you make a decision like this, uh, you know, th there's, no, there's no easy decision. Uh, you try to balance all the things. What we had going on, uh, fortunately, uh, is number one, Ohioans doing a magnificent job. They got us here. Number two, uh, we now have the testing uh, number three, we now have the tracing that's being ramped up uh, in May. So it seemed the time that we could start down the pathway. Um, we will be criticized from, one, from some people who say we shouldn't have opened up at all. Uh, we'll be criticized from other people who understandably, uh, and they're both understandable opinions, but other people who, who, who would say, you know, some will say we, we, we didn't, we shouldn't have opened up at all. Some would say we didn't open up enough. Um, and, I, and I understand that. Uh, to the best of my ability, I think we've found the sweet spot. Uh, I think we've found the spot that is, is most likely uh, to cause less damage, mo more likely to cause good. Um, but uh, it's, it, it's a risk, and I fully understand the risk. I will add that um, it has been my absolute honor to advise the governor um, all through this as whole teams of people are. And what we have to remember here is that the entire country is trying to figure this out the exact way. And prior to this, there was no roadmap. In doing this, we've looked at every, every piece of advice. There's something called um, a roadmap to recovery. It's, it's a guide that was put together for all the governors facing these incredibly hard decisions that look at all the best evidence um, from all the best folks in multiple sectors. And there isn't one exact right way forward. And that's, I know that's a hard truth for people because we want there to be a right answer in a right way. And that's why I have always advised the governor to weigh all of these things, which he is, and I, I can't tell you enough, when you're an ordinary person, as I was a year and something ago, you just can't imagine how much has to go into this. And it just, again, it's, it makes you humble, and it gives me great pleasure to serve someone who has to make the hard decisions. But the truth is, we need to, as a governor has done, layer this and, and go 
slowly in a measured way as he is trying to present, make moves, that's my dimmer switch, and being more surgical, and then we'll learn from that, as will the entire country and world, and we'll make adjustments. We'll have to do audibles. You, we do all your planning for the game, but you get up to the line and you're gonna see what plays out, and the governor will continue to make those decisions and lead us through. And, and so we'll do that layer by layer. We have better and better data all the time that we'll use to measure it. We'll work harder on testing, harder on PPE. We'll build up our contact tracing and we'll do all those things, not one thing, but all of it to the very best of our ability all at once. And we'll rely on you at home because we might, we've been saying stay at home. I've been thinking a lot about healthy at home because we still want to limit our movement we still want to stay six feet apart. We still want to selectively go out and do those errands. All those things will continue to matter and add up. And as we add more and more essentialness to our lives and we try more and more things, we still have to keep doing that together. That's our individual role. And each business person, we've been giving the best advice we can to businesses about how to do it. And I, I see them all rising to the wanting to do that well. And it will take all of us doing this and walking this journey step by step together. So I hope, I hope that we realize this is a journey and, and we're on the next stage of it. Thank you. Hello, this is Ben Garbrick with ABC6 and Fox 28. Uh, Governor, I wonder if you could elaborate on some of the businesses which will not be reopening right away, like gyms and restaurants. Can you give us a sense for if everything goes according to plan and we do not see a spike in cases, how quickly might some of those businesses start to reopen? How large of a sample size of data do you need? Are we talking weeks, potentially months? I don't think we know. Uh, I wish we knew. I wish I could tell people. I wish I could, you know, open everything today. And I wish we could come up, if not that, come up with a roadmap with, with dates on it. Uh, but we really can't do that. What we've tried to do is come up with things where we could get more people back to work at the same time protecting those people. I mean, it's, it's a question of protecting employees. It is a, protect, it's a question of not seeing this spread. So, you know, you almost, it's almost like on a continuum. You know, who can you protect? Who can you get back to work with the least risk? Understanding there's always risk. Uh, but within a controlled environment, um, you can make it safer. So, you know, a, a, a company, for example, that can enforce the six feet, that can have the, uh, the, the mask, the facial covering, um, you do the sanitation, that's one environment. Uh, when you move obviously to retail, uh, you, it's less control, you certainly can control some things, but it's, it's less control, it's more contact. Um, you know, great desire to do hair, uh, and I, 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 I fully get that. Um, and we're going to get there. But again, you're talking about very, very close contact with, with, with two people. Even if they have a mask, even both have masks, it's still, fairly, it's still very close contact. When you talk about gyms, um, again, a lot, of, a, lot of people, a lot of people together uh, it becomes a group of people. So you can just kind of walk through each one of those. And it's not a, you know, I don't think it's an exact science, but when you talk to the people who study this, how things get spread, they can kind of give you a continuum. And so we started, really started over here with things that we can control. We're going to end up over here. And, of course, the last thing that comes in is when you have mass gatherings. And, and you know, the, and unfortunately, these are things we love. These are concerts. These are, these are ball games. Um, and there may be – I'm not ruling – out that you couldn't figure out, you know, you, at some point you can't figure out a way to do a baseball game, for example, or a football game where you have people spread out and you do, you know, a lot of things. But so we're not ruling anything out, but that's sort of the continuum uh, as we go forward. I'm going to let the lieutenant governor, because he was worked on the task force. Uh, I don't know, John, do you have anything to add to that? You know, it is. The best way to explain it is that, that the businesses that are allowed to be reopened, they can meet the protocols. We know that they can do this and create safe work environments. They've proven that they can do it over the course of the global pandemic. Maybe many of these businesses have operated global 
global operations and uh, have said that, that, you know, look, you follow these protocols, um, we can do it. But when you start having that close interaction with people, that's when all of our health advisors get very nervous about, about exacerbating the spread. And if you do all of this at once, they, it's hard for them to know exactly what the cause was. So when you stage it, you get a, you get a feel for how successfully you can do these things. And, and then as you build confidence, then you do more. But hopefully, look, this all along, the compliance with what the governor is asking people to do that lowers those numbers, make sure that the next thing comes sooner because we, we have addressed the issues. So the more we do the things that, that stomp down the coronavirus, as I say, we're going to hunt it down, we're going to isolate it, and we're going to kill it. The more we do that, the faster the next phases come. I'd yeah, maybe just state the obvious that, you know, every business is different. Uh, if you if you look at retail, we can envision a, a retail business that we have gone into that probably doesn't get, you know, a, a lot of floor traffic. There's space. Um, and, you know, you could say, well, that one, that's less of a risk than some other re retail. Um, and, you know, what we went through was a situation where we needed to keep open the essential ones, certainly on food. you got to have food. Um, but what we've seen is that, the, you know, the grocery stores have really d developed a way of doing things. I mean, the one-way aisle, um, I'm not sure that's something I would have figured out, but they figured, some of them figured it out. And so we've learned from those, those things. Where that's how you keep people a, a, a apart. So, you know, each business is different. Um, we, we think by, you know, setting this date for retail uh, that we're going to be able to get some small businesses back in the game. Uh, we know they've been out a long time. We know they've been hurt. We know some of them tragically may not be able to come back at all. Uh, but we think by setting this date, they can start planning and they can start, start moving forward. Hi, this is Jesse Balmer with the Cincinnati Inquirer. My question is, if you're a worker who's at one of these places that is reopening and you might have an underlying condition um, and you're concerned about kind of choosing between your health and your livelihood, are, is, is there any kind of recourse or protections or options for you? Well, first of all, we would hope uh, that the employer, if at all possible, would try to make arrangements for that valued employee um, who for maybe the next year, we don't know how long, but for a period of time that won't last forever, um, you know, is in, at a higher risk than some of the other employees. And so we would hope that some of this gets worked out. We know that it doesn't, things don't always get worked out, but we would hope that, you know, that would be the first, first thing that could, could take place. Um, but yeah, these are, uh, will there be difficult decisions? I'm, I'm sure there will be some difficult decisions. I, I could add something to that. Um, I know that uh, the White House guidelines call for a phased in return for work, and they and they talk about accommodating uh, uh, vulnerable individuals as part of the third phase. And so we're encouraging, and this is what the business the, the business folks are a part of this. We want to encourage people, businesses, to make sure that the environment's comfortable for their employees. That's why we have all these safety standards. And, and, and we also know that if you furloughed a lot of people, just because we announced that you can reopen, it's not going to just flip a light switch and everybody's going to have jobs because you got to build, you got to build um, a customer base. you got to build a market for your products, and that's going to take time and products and services. And so we encourage employers to phase individuals who may have health issues or in those vulnerable populations to phase them in last after we we know that that uh, this is working that we're we're defeating coronavirus and we can create a, a an even safer environment for them so I think businesses are are we were just asking them to keep that in mind as they're making these hiring decisions Adrian Robbins, NBC4, and my question's for the Lieutenant Governor. Um, obviously, we're going to see quite a few Ohioans go back to work over the next few weeks, which is great news, but I'm still getting quite a few emails, as I think many people are, from people who haven't seen any of their unemployment benefits and have been applying since March. 
what would you say to somebody who's headed back to work and never received the assistance and now feels like they're kind of being left behind? Well, uh, as we've discussed on, on many occasions, uh, the folks at the unemployment compensation system at ODJFS are, are, are continuing to ramp up. Just it, your question gives me an opportunity to, to provide a little bit more color to this. Uh, so far, 446,000 Ohioans have been serviced through the unemployment comp system. They've paid out $1.24 billion in benefits. And for the individual that you described who may be headed back to work before they get their unemployment compensation, they are still eligible for, for that compensation for, from the date that they were first deemed eligible for it. So they, it will get backdated. Uh, if they go and take a job, they will be compensated for that time period. That's how the, 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 system, uh, the system works. And, uh, but we're continuing. They now have uh, 1,657 employees uh, out at ODJFS. I know that they cut the wait time down on the phones to 14 minutes, which I look at these metrics and these are the kinds of things that I wanna see. It's still not where it needs to be. That is not, that is still not, anytime somebody is not getting through, it's not acceptable to us. We, we can continue to urge patients. We know that, that the system continues to, to improve but it's not serving any, everybody adequately. But to that person you talked about, continue to seek your application, continue the benefits, if you're eligible for them, will be on the way and backdated to the point that they were first eligible. Question for the governor. Jim Province with the Toledo Blade. Um, governor, did you consider a more geographic approach to your reopening rollout? given that some areas of the state have seen fewer cases? And is it wise to treat the entire state the same way? Well, we certainly did consider a geographical approach. Um, I know that that was suggested earlier this morning um, as a possible way to deal with this. But we are all on the, in this together. Um, Having 113 health departments make separate individual decisions, I think would have been a disaster across the state of Ohio. Uh, I think people would have been confused. Uh, you know, you could do this in, in, in one, uh, one health district and uh, you go right next door uh, and you could do something else. Uh, so while I, I'm a great believer in local control, uh, I've consulted uh, a lot with mayors, I've consulted with local, other local officials throughout this process. I am going to continue to do that. I've talked with legislators a lot, um, and I understand, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm a big believer in local control, but uh, the thought of having 113 different decisions uh, made on every issue uh, as we go across the state of Ohio uh, just does not make any sense. And so if you were doing one thing in one district uh, and then somebody lives two miles over uh, in another one, uh, you know, they, them going and doing that in one area, just it would be total confusion and it would cause a lot, a lot of people to be moving around. So I just don't think it would work. Um, now John, John, and I've talked about this. We've talked about how to do this and what, what possibility. Um, yeah, we've. Look, we've heard uh, we've heard those voices. Um, you know, I Jim. You know, I grew up in Northwest Ohio. If you have one, if you have one standard in one of the surrounding counties and a different one in Lucas County, where Toledo is, you're just going to have people from from one county going to the next county. And and I think I'll let, I'll turn to let Dr. Acton address this. That's the exact opposite of what we want to see happen because then, then you're starting to mix populations and you can't isolate the coronavirus, which is the whole concept behind testing. Uh, Dr. Acton? Yeah, this has um, been a very good question that we've discussed amongst my peers. And um, you'll see this discussion rising. And I think it's a matter of timing. I think we can see now that we're so interrelated, an outbreak anywhere affects somewhere else. and so. We have to look at this globally, because when you think about travel as we move forward, that will be an issue, and we can't avoid that. We need certain things to be national, 
then we're going to have to look at it as states. And eventually, as we have a better understanding, right now we don't really know exactly how many cases we have or what's really going on at the local level, but we're going to try hard to study it because I think there is a time in the future where there will be more regional approaches, but we're just, we're just not there yet. I want to say, too, that you know, it's really important that we remember, you know, I want it to be clear that health isn't nervous. Um, we are not afraid. Uh, we are more determined than ever. And I say this meaning that every advice we give is going to be based on the best and available science at the time that we have. And we're very determined. I can tell you that local health departments are doubling down. The governor was on the call with them today. We are doubling down. All the physicians and healthcare and frontline providers of which I'm representing are doubling down to do better than ever. Our hospitals have made new partnerships with nursing homes and prisons and local health departments that have never existed in the state. We are innovating and we are doubling down. Our frontline first responders are doubling down. So I just want people to know that, you know, we will do this wisely, responsibly, and we'll double down our efforts. And when we make these choices we make, to go slow, to go fast, that is the way to, the best way to ensure our economy gets going and stays. So thank you. I want to return to the Lieutenant Governor uh, on a different subject, John. Yeah, I, I know that I, I got a couple of texts here from people about asking about masks and, and what the governor is asking people to do with regard to masks. Understand, this, this is not an idea that actually came from us. It's an idea that came from the business group uh, who said, essentially, let us go back to work. We'll wear masks. We want to, because we want to keep, because th this is the dilemma that they have. They want employees to come back. Uh, they want customers to come back. And they know that, this, that the more comfort and confidence that you can build amongst their workforce and amongst uh, the, the consumers out there, the more business that they're ultimately going to have, the better they're going to be able to serve people. And so this was a recommendation out of the business tax, task force um, because they wanted to build that confidence. And, and I want to, we use the term face coverings, and I, I really want to make sure that we, we understand what that means. You know, I think when we talk about masks, you know, people think of something like this. But then you also have the one that I wear, which my daughter made me, which is a, out of a cut-up old T-shirt that I wear over uh, when I'm walking around. But I also, last night when I was home, cut up an old T-shirt, took a safety pin, and just pinned something over my nose and over my mouth. Uh, you can use a bandana. It's really just something to cover your, your nose and your mouth is what, is what, what the recommendation uh, in the order is. There's not a public mandate that when you walk out of your house, we can't, we can't make you wear one uh, when you're walking down the street or, or going uh, to your neighbor's house. Um, but we're recommending it because we know that it keeps people safer. And, and these are the best recommendations, and they're, they're not something that just came um, from us. They're things that businesses said. They said, we, we would like to have this. We want to build confidence in our employees so they know we're doing everything we can to, to, to keep the environment safe and that we're building an environment that our customers will come back. So I just wanted to take a moment to address that because I know we're, we're getting some questions, and, and Governor, you may want to add. Uh, well, I'll just add one thing. None of this is going to last forever. Um, we're going to get through this. Now, we're not going to get through it in two weeks, but we're, we're going to get through this. Uh, and we will not have to do these things. But for us to be able to push forward and to get people to work, we've got to take the safety precautions. And I not only have I heard from a, a lot of people uh, about this who, um, you know, are concerned about some of the things that we're requiring. But I've heard from a lot of employees who have told me, I want to be safe when I go back to work. 
I've heard a lot of families of employees who have said, when I go back to work, I want to be safe. How are you going to make sure that I am safe? And the answer is, I can't guarantee anybody's safety. But what we can do is do the things that we know will dramatically increase the odds for us or for those employees. And, and so for anybody who doesn't think that an employee wearing facial covering uh, is, is a good idea, I, I guess I would ask them to talk to that employee, talk to the employees and who are worried, talk to the ones who are worried about their safety. And so all the things that you saw on the board a moment ago were worked through very, very carefully in consultation with experts, but also with businessmen and women who put these things together and who said, I want to ensure that my employees are safe. And so the facial covering is not something that I grew up with, and it's not something that most of us grew up with. And it's not going to be something that's going to be with us forever. But during this time of crisis, if we want to get back to work and have folks come back to work, we got to do the logical things that to protect them. And to not do it would be negligent. To not do it would be a mistake. We got to protect these employees. Good afternoon, Ben Schwartz with WCPO in Cincinnati. Um, Governor DeWine, we have been getting a lot of questions sent in from parents of young children wondering what their summers are going to look like. Um, I know you wrote, started to roll out your plan today and with the emphasis that we're taking it very slow for an important reason. But I want to ask if you've had any conversations about opening things like pools or summer camps with a decreased number of people there. We've certainly looked at about everything uh, because we hear from people and, you know, I've gotten text, emails uh, about summer camp, um, people, uh, you know, who run summer camps, people who send their children to summer camps. Um, and we have not, you know, we've not really made a decision on that, and I wish we could. We've got to see how we do at this stage, um, and we've got to, I, what I would just advise anybody who runs a summer camp or, or anything else, you know, start thinking through how you would be able to do the social distancing. And you know, obviously with children, it is not, it is not particularly easy. But uh, if there's ways to do it and, and you know, have that child get the benefit of, of doing uh, what, what they've been doing in the past or what kids have been doing in the past, that would be, you know, that would be a good thing. We're just not ready at this point uh, to be able to, to make that, that decision. Uh, and, and again, we've got to see how this works and kind of take this one, one, one week at a time. Hi, everyone. Aron Hammy with WLIO in Lima. Uh, my question is for the governor and lieutenant governor, if we could return to the face masks, face coverings once again. Uh, many on social media right now are saying that they think this is ineffective. Um, how are you recommending to the businesses to enforce their rules within the stores and uh, how they should go about people who are refusing to wear them inside their stores. Well, uh, Dr. Acton talked about the effectiveness. I mean, we've talked about this a lot up here, and it's more, my understanding, uh, it's more you're protecting uh, the other person, and the other protect person is protecting you. So if a clerk in a store is wearing it and the customer is wearing it, then they're, protect they're protecting each other. Ultimately, it's going to be up to the store uh, you know, to, to regulate that, um, you know, ultimately beyond that, of course, is, is the health department. But look, we're not in the, we're not about trying to make things onerous just to be doing it. We're trying to be able to protect people. And so what every person who I have talked to who understands the science behind this says is you do the social distancing. And if you add in that both people or all people have some facial covering is you dramatically in your, increase your odds of not getting uh, a virus if one of those people happens to be shedding, one of those people has to be, happens to be contagious. You're just significantly increasing your odds. And so we have a small environment or maybe a bigger environment in the store, depending on the size of the store, 
but it's it's not just for the protection of the person who's wearing it. In fact, it's more for the protection of other people. And if you require in that setting, in that business setting, that both parties uh, have that, uh, then you've added to to that that protection. I will I will add one thing, and then I'll throw it to Dr. Acton to talk about the 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 effectiveness. But this is the feedback that we we got from businesses when we were having this conversation. They said, we want him because we want to go faster. We want to get through this. We know that this is an effective tool so that we can slow the spread. And they also are worried about it because and they like the idea that we require it so that it's not necessarily on them to do it because they don't want to have flare-ups in their own businesses because they know in many cases that if that happens, then they're going to have to shut down or it could spread and it could be very disruptive. So many of the things that we're asking in here are already being effectively done in businesses that are operating. Uh, and those are the best practices. That's what they encourage that we do uh, because we all, we all just want to get through this. And these are the temporary things, as the governor mentioned, that we can do to get through this so that we can, you know, move on to a less restrictive way of living. Dr. Acton? Thank you. I want to agree with all of that. I think um, we want to empower you as an individual to have the tools you need. And we're trying to help businesses as well have the tools they need. And you know, this mask is, again, I, I feel people's pain on this one because I'm one of those people that has a fan going at night and wants lots of air movement. And so, you know, in other cultures, this has become a symbol of courtesy to each other, care for each other, because you know they realized, having gone through a few of these um, epidemics of similar viruses, that this made a difference. And so we know this is an added. The science is showing that it makes a difference. Um, it is an asymptomatically transmitted virus, so I might be carrying it and not know it. And what I do might affect somebody else who doesn't have the opportunity to go back at work because that worker now takes it home to a spouse who's already sick or a child who's already sick. So this really is going to be one of those collective things um, that I myself have to, have to keep putting around my neck and reminding myself that what I'm doing is, is bigger than me. It's, it's for all of us. And it's helping us move forward and move our economy forward. Good afternoon, Noah Blundo with Hannah News Service. I have a question about the contract, contact tracing workforce. Uh, first, the numbers you specified, were those in addition to the local health workers and volunteers or inclusive of them? And then what kind of um, clinical skills and language skills and other skills does someone need to be able to be part of this workforce? I'll start. My understanding is that the 1750 is the total, which would include uh, what health departments already have. Health departments, as you know, do this every every day. They just don't do it in its biggest biggest scale. So we'll add to that. They will hire more people. We will have some people to to to, to surge to surge in, um, and so that's where the 1750 uh, will come from. As far as the skill set. Um, I think it's important that the people who are hired have the ability to communicate with the communities that are impacted. So if there's a language situation, uh, if a community has a number of languages spoken, then the health department would certainly want and we would want uh, people who could speak those languages if possible. Um, you know, we would, one of the things that uh, Partners in Health has learned around the world is that when you get a, a local health worker, the most important thing is that someone that, that um, can relate to the person that they're talking to, the person that they're interviewing. Now, most of these will be over the phone. Not all of them will be over the phone, but most, most interviews will be over the phone. But just the ability to relate to that, to that person, uh, to be able to help them, uh, to guide them, and also to find out from them, you know, who they may have been in, in, in contact with. So those are some of the skill sets that, that I think uh, our, our local health departments will be looking for and that certainly we will be looking for as we hire people to surge in when we have hot spots in, in one community or another. Dr. Acton, anything to... 
I would just add that this sort of disease investigation is something that is going on all the time for all sorts of infectious diseases, from TB to measles outbreaks. And so our local health departments are very skilled at this. Um, but it has always involved a wider range of people and talents. And we also have always used community health workers in our health departments in various capacities. So what Partners in Health is doing with their program is a very specific training, a just-in-time training. We can help folks um, expand that workforce, but be very specifically able to take that skill set, but meet people where they're at, and be, again, a trusted person to talk to. I can tell you that my experience of this field over 30-some years is that people love uh, talking to someone. They love knowing. Uh, maybe that they were at risk or had been exposed, and they love the help in what to do next. Talk to your doctor. Here's what you should look for. Here are the symptoms. Call us if you need help. So this is a helping thing, and people really experience it this way. It's been going on all along, but as we know, as we get about and move about more, all of us will come into contact with people more, and therefore, you know, it's just a, a volume um, that we've now estimated is greater than anyone has had as a workforce prior to this. And, and I'm very excited about it, um, but I'm really excited about it meeting everyone where they're at. That's so essential in this. We don't want to leave anyone behind. Thank you. Hi, Governor. Andy Chow with Ohio Public Radio and Television's State House News Bureau. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about enforcement. Um, is, do, do companies face a second-degree misdemeanor if they're not following these rules? Um, and uh, how confident are you that these, these standards are going to be enforced? You know, Andy, we've had very good experience uh, when we issued the first orders. Um, were there a few exceptions? Well, sure. But uh, by and large, Ohioans uh, did everything they could to comply, and they, and they did that. Um, th these ultimately are enforced by local health departments. Uh, they can be enforced by the, by the police. But um, what we found in the last number of weeks since our first orders went into effect is really how they're enforced it, it is by individuals either in the workplace uh, who are concerned about the environment. It's not good enough. Uh, it's not safe enough. Uh, you know, people in the public who, who say this situation is not right. So I think it's almost going to be self-enforced in that, in that sense. Self-enforced is not the right word, I guess. But, but there's going to be, I think, community pressure to make sure that people um, you know, provide a, a safe place, first with manufacturing and then, then in a few days later when we get to the point of, of um, uh, retail. Uh, you know, I think that, uh, and, and again, I think people are beginning to really understand that when you wear, for example, uh, 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 something on your face, it is, it is a courtesy to the other person more than it's a protection for you. And it's a mutual courtesy. And I think people will, will start to understand that. And again, it's, it's not forever. Uh, you know, we're going to get back to the point where you're not going to be wearing these and you're not going to wear them when you go into a store. We're just, we're just not there yet. Governor DeWine, this is Laura Hancock from Cleveland.com. Um, you said that the stay-at-home order is still in effect, but when our favorite boutiques and stores open, people are understandably going to want to patronize them. So aren't you more or less lifting the stay-at-home order? Well, I, you, I, I think that, you know, if you look at what we're really asking people to do, um, we're asking them to do pretty much what they've been doing, um, be reasonable, be rational, uh, you know, don't, don't take, uh, you know, huge chances. If you want to go out and walk, that's great. If you want to go to the state park, that's great. Uh, you know, in the past, they've been able to go to a grocery store. They've been able to go to a pharmacy. Now they might go to some other, other retail. But just kind of use common sense in, in how they do that. Uh, you know, we're the, we're the, we're the, we're the protection. Uh, try to keep your distance. Um, so, in reality, it is a, a common sense approach to how you deal with a situation that is still a dangerous situation. It, you know, everyone is still just as susceptible 
to coming down with uh, the COVID-19. And, and so we decided just to kind of keep the, keep the stay-at-home order. But as you know, that order has many, many exceptions. Uh, and, you know, people need to, need to go get groceries. They need to go to a pharmacy. They need to do, uh, you know, help a neighbor. They can, do, they can do all of these things. So, again, it's going to come down not so much what I say. It's going to come down to what Ohioans actually do. Uh, not what I say, what it, but really what Ohioans do. And, and I think Ohioans are going to continue to use common sense. Uh, they're going to continue to uh, make rational decisions. And, um, you know, this is going to give them, under this order, not only is it going to get these businesses back going, it's going to give people a little, some more options, some more things that they can, they can do. Um, and so we are, it's, it's, it's a step forward uh, as, as we move, move forward. But the stay-at-home order uh, is just that signal that, hey, things are still dangerous. I mean, it's not, you know, we don't wave a flag and say, you know, May 1, everything is safe, because that's not. I mean, what Dr. Acton and the Lieutenant Governor and I have promised people to do every single day is to try to tell you the truth. The best we knew the truth, the best we knew the facts. Uh, and when I started this press conference, I started the way I did for a reason, because there are essential facts that are essential facts. One is you all have done a great job. Two um, is that the COVID-19 is still out there, it is just as dangerous as it ever has been. Uh, and three, we still have the same tools. Now we have a few more tools uh, than we had before. And we got to use those tools. And the distancing is probably more important than, than anything else. And you follow that, and you kind of layer over that with the with the mask or the facial facial covering. Hello, Governor. This is uh, Luis Gill with Ohio Latino TV. This question might be for the Lieutenant Governor. Uh, the questions: uh, the May first comes, and new business start opening, and the employee already receiving benefits, unemployment benefits. Now going back to work, it gets ill with the coronavirus in a few days. Would this person will allow to uh, reapply for unemployment? It, it's had to, and that person will self quarantine. I, I'm, I'm not sure I heard your question correctly. I'll try. I, I think what I heard is that you're saying, you know, if somebody goes to work on mm -hmm. May 1, could they still be eligible for the benefits that they didn't receive earlier? Is that correct? No. If they go to back to work and they get ill through going at work, and then... Yes, yes. If they go back to work and they get ill, that's been the policy all along, and the policy will, will maintain that if your employer sends you home uh, and you don't have uh, a sick leave policy or benefits, which I believe m most employers can and should... Uh, provide you in those those cases because the reason is we don't they shouldn't want you at work if you get ill your employer shouldn't want you at work they should want you to go home immediately as a matter of fact they're required to do that under the order to, to get you out of there to get you uh, home to get you medical care if that's the place they need to go and under our and under our order you would be if that was going to be a sustained period and you didn't have benefits through your employer you could apply for unemployment compensation benefits until you got well. And so, uh, you know, those are, the, those are the rules as they are now. Those rules won't change uh, as we go forward. Sir. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Randy Ludlow with the Columbus Dispatch. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, you face a lot of pressure to reopen more and more quickly than what you authorized today including some of your Republicans saying, reopen everything Friday. Um, how easy was it to hold out against that pressure? And what's the rationale of waiting two more weeks to open retail? Well, the rationale for waiting two more weeks is we're layering it in. Uh, we don't know the impact of, of doing one thing. And it takes a while to start seeing that. So if you layer these things in, then, then you can move forward. Um, but you, we hope we'll not be in a position where we have to, we have to fall back. Uh, I talked uh, earlier, Randy, about the, kind of the continuum. Um, and every business is different. But in general, um, in, in a manufacturing situation, for example, or construction, or most construction that would be outside, um, 
you have the ability to control the environment. Retail, you can control the environment, but it certainly is in a, in a closer um, situation. Um, and I think most people, when they put them on the scale uh, from the safest to the not as safe, with mass gatherings clear over here, um, you know, would probably put the retail like in here. And so we wanted to delay it a little bit, but we also knew that there's a lot of business men and women who, who really, really, really need to get back uh, and start, start opening up. So it's a balance. It's the balance that we've been dealing with on, you know, ev everything that we do. Uh, Ohioans have done a great job. Um, I think now, with the fact, in May that we have the testing, uh, more robust testing and uh, more tracing, those two things put together makes May, uh, and the fact, as you saw on the, on the data, uh, that we're go going down in most things, hospitalizations, for example, uh, made this an, an opportune time to do it. But uh, the virus is still out there. Yeah, it is still killing people. Um, it's not going to go away. And we know the more we open up, the, the more, as you and I talked about uh, last week, uh, the more you open up and the more contacts you have, no matter how careful you are, the number of incidents of cases is probably probably going to go up. That was part of your question. I mean, I don't think I answered one, another part. Was another part of the question, Randy? Still, a lot of people, including fellow Republicans, calling you open up everything immediately. Uh, obviously, you disagree with them. Uh, Look, the, the, these are a balance, and to th throw the doors open uh, on May 1 and say, get rid of the stay-at-home order, get rid of the distance, get rid of everything, uh, would be totally irresponsible. Um, I have an obligation as governor of the state to do two things right now <laughs> and, f and work every day, get people back to work and keep them safe. Um, that would not be consistent with pe keeping people safe. Uh, there is nothing that has really changed other than Ohioans that have done a bang-up job. Um, but if Ohioans go back to business as usual, um, you know, this thing is going to go straight back up. And the curve is going to go straight back up. We're going to have more Ohioans die. And so I'm not going to do that. Um, you know, I'm trying to balance the harm from the economy, understanding also that for business to really come back, people have to feel safe. And so Ohioans have to feel safe. That means employees have to feel safe. That means customers have to feel safe. The way we are doing this today uh, is the best guarantee that we can have that Ohioans will feel safe, that they can start back in um, into retail, go into the stores, uh, that there's protections there in place for them, and that they can go back to work, and that their employer ha has got r rules, regulations, standards that really has been put forward by the business community. Uh, but the best practices that we know of so they can go back to work. That's how we get Ohioans back to work. As my friend Frank Sullivan told me a couple hours ago when I was talking to him on the phone, he says, this idea that getting people back to work and politically opposed to each other, he says, that's crazy. He said, you know, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can do these things. And I'm convinced Ohioans are. I have confidence in Ohioans. I'm optimistic about our future. Uh, but I'm not going to be reckless about it either. That's the last question for today. Hey, wow. All right. We know over the last uh, several weeks, Ohioans have stepped up in so many ways to protect each other from this virus, and I am so very, very grateful. Uh, all of your efforts remind me of a well-known hymn written by Ohio composer 
Will Thompson. Uh, Will Thompson was born in East Liverpool in 1847, graduated from then Mount Union College. And the lyrics from his song uh, that my son-in-law Bill, uh, Bill Darling, uh, reminded me of, um, this is what the song is, um, Have I Done Any Good? Uh, I think those, those lyrics capture the, really the soul of Ohio and how Ohioans are always there to help other in, others in need. Let me read just a little bit uh, from these ly lyrics. Have I done any good, and I won't sing it, uh, have I done any good in the world today? Have I helped anyone in need? Have I cheered up the sad and made someone feel glad? If not, I have failed indeed. Has anyone's burden been lighter today because I was willing to share? Have the sick and the weary been helped on their way? Have they been helped when they needed my help? Was I there? There are chances for work all around just now, opportunities right in our way. Do not let them pass by saying, sometime I'll try, but go and do something today. Tis noble of man to work and to give, love's labor has merit alone. Only he who does something helps others to live. To God, each good work will be known. Then wake up and do something more. Then dream of your mansion above. Doing good is a pleasure, a joy beyond measure, a blessing of duty and love. End of quote. Uh, Ohioans have done so very much good. Uh, we see it every single day. You've flattened the curve. You've kept our hospitals from being overrun. You've done so much to save lives. And you have saved lives. Uh, we have to keep it up so we can beat the spread of this virus and get back to the things that we like to do that brings us joy. Uh, the Columbus Zoo and the wilds are two of my favorite places to visit, my grandchildren and, and, and our children. Uh, Fran and I have taken a number of our children to the Columbus Zoo. There's a picture of Parker. There's Parker and it looks like Jack there. Uh, and Fran and myself, uh, and that was that was last year. Uh, but we've taken a number of the kids there. Um, Columbus Zoo and the wilds, of course, are, are closed right now. Uh, but the animals are still there. And uh, let's take a look at the at the video. Today, our entrance is closed. Our paths empty. And our public spaces quiet. But this silence does not mute our passion. And we're reminded of something that is core to who we are. We have a responsibility to care for one another. And our zoo is not just about the incredible wildlife. It's also about the people, our community, and our planet. We are all connected. And we look forward to the day we can all be together again. Sharing meaningful experiences. Creating memories to last a lifetime. While touching hearts and teaching minds. Until then, remember that we are all in this together. We are all in this together. Thank you all for what you have done so far as we continue uh, on this journey. Stay strong, everybody. We'll see you all tomorrow at 2 o'clock.